We have Mr. Nabil Mancheri, Secretary General, the Global Rare Earth Industry Association, Brussels. To introduce Mr. Mancheri, Mr. Nabil Mancheri was formerly a senior researcher and project manager at the Department of Material Engineering, KU Leuven, Be Belgium. Before joining KU Leuven in 2018, he was a Marie Curie Fellow at the Institute of Environmental Sciences, CML, at the Leiden University in the Netherlands. A PhD holder from Jawaharlal Nehru University, he has held academic positions in universities in India, Japan, the Netherlands, and has been a visiting fellow in universities in China, the US, and Australia. He was named one of the top emerging geoeconomists in the world by John Hopkins University, US. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Mancheri. I now hand it over to you to deliver the keynote address. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nisha, for the nice introduction. And maybe you can ask your colleague to share my slides. That's better. And uh, while I speak, and I uh, thank <coughs> uh, the China Studies Forum, which is a great initiative uh, of the ICSB, uh, China, Chennai Center for China Studies, and Prasad Institute of India. And it's actually, I appreciate and, and I congratulate the team for coming up with this nice idea. And, and thanks, uh, Mr. Hebelkar, Mr. Sashinar, and others uh, for you know, providing me an opportunity to, 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 to give you a, a, a small speech. And, and, and Professor, uh, Mr. Hebelkar and Professor Patel has given you a nice background. Uh, so I'm not need to you know, explain you, uh, you know, what is rare earth and where it is used but rather I would focus uh, what is the current global market situation? What is the vulnerabilities? Uh, Nisha, can you see if, if you can share my screen? One second, sir, it's coming up, sir. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, as, they, as they move, um, like uh, Nisha said, uh, I am the Secretary General at the Global Rare Earth Industry Association. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, which is uh, a global association uh, founded in 2019 uh, with the support of European Commission. And now we have grown to 40 members and uh, with the Multicultural and Experience Board and Advisory Board. Next slide, please. Uh, so we, we also work with a number of uh, global associates and government entities, largely uh, from European Commission side, and, and also you know Department of Energy in US, which is an institute called Critical Material Institutes. It's actually like you know Professor Patel mentioned that you know US has initiated a number of initiatives to check the to to improve the supply uh, diversification. This was one of the as research aspect of bringing the Critical Material Institute after the 2010 crisis. Then we are also partnering with Natural Resource Canada and of course from Japan, JOKMEC, you know, which is active in the raw material field. And after the 2010 crisis, uh, you know, they invested uh, considerable amount of money in, in, in a couple of rare earth companies to secure and Japan was successful in, in diversifying their supply. And of course, we are also partnering in to develop the international standard on rare earth, uh, which is actually led by India is a member of the ISO TC 98, which is on rare earth. Uh, but China, you know, uh, standardization organization is the leader, but you know, Japan is very active, US is very active, and some of the European com uh, countries are very active in this association. Next one, please. Uh, so our mission is that the association, why the European Commission uh, set up, this was basically to provide the information because the world was in the dark when the 2010 crisis happened. Then the world realized, you know, how important this is. So our main mission is to promote and a uh, sustainable because uh, Dr. Patel also mentioned sustainability is the key for, for the coming industrialization. So sustainable, responsible, uh, and collaborative and transparent. There are also transparency issues 
uh, both of these previous speakers mentioned the importance of Myanmar, the illegal trade between Myanmar, the Rakhine state and the and the Chinese companies. So this is the, the uh, you know, the transparency is key. So need to coordinate all these things. We need an international organization. The, 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 the background was something like, you know, the, the oil crisis happened in 173. The world leaders came up with the International Energy Agency. So something like that, but we work as an international organization. Next one, please. Uh, so to give you a background, uh, you know, I'm not talking about what is the rare earth, but we should be aware of, uh, this is not an easy subject. And this is not something like iron, copper, or aluminum. Like Patel said, this is, you know, it's, it's, it's not rare, but it's actually rare. It is difficult to process. And there are a number of midstream value chain. So, uh, you know, China has built this industry for last 30 years. We need to realize that. And to crack that market, to crack that dominance, uh, it's, you need multi agency, multi industry effort, especially I'm talking with reference to India and uh, this, we need to see this as a strategic sector, something we did with uh, our atomic energy program, our you know space program. We need to see this as a strategic industry. If you want to build an industry for the 2050, if you're looking for a carbon neutral world, if you are looking for you know new energy like wind energy in, in 50 years, so it's a long term strategy and you need these materials. And, and basic thing, uh, one of the basic thing is that you know these materials are used very powerful permanent magnets and which is called ndfab and those are the one that is uh, used in electric mobility and a lot of small application uh, defense applications and wind turbines uh, and but also others are also in other make other elements are also important in batteries battery storage catalyst you know for example now we use a lot of rare earth, this oxide we import from china for because we are a large consumer of the petroleum so we use this for refining we, our refining companies are use this material for their petroleum refining so and ceramic you know the importance of both defense and other applications of ceramics so this is very important next one please uh, so what happened uh, uh, you know we wrote at national institute of advanced studies and me and my senior colleague wrote a report in 2013 you know, dominating the world china and the rare earth industry and even after eight years ten years china still dominate but you know with the great help of japan uh, the uh, the dependence many of the countries have been able to reduce their dependence on china uh, and if you look at this table at the mine i'm now this this figure looks at the the mine you know who are the miners but that's not the case if you mine doesn't make any sense now because you need to process it you need to make into the oxide you need to next value chain is you want to make it to the to the metal and for example to make metal you don't have many many companies or many countries who are able to make metals and then metal goes to the other applications that i show in the previous year so china still control about 75 percentage of the of the material mined and 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 rest of the world like us 11 percent but 11 percent after process, you know, initial processing, uh, the concentrate goes to China, process there because that mine is 10% owned by a Chinese company, the Euro, Euro mine. Then the Myanmar, you know, you know the case, you know, there are a lot of formal trade between Myanmar uh, and also informal trade between the Myanmar, the, the border states. And most important one, uh, you know, about 75%, you know, in rare earth, you know, there are, they are called 17 elements. They're called lower rare earth and heavy rare earth. And 75% of the Chinese demand are met by uh, the import from Myanmar for the heavy minerals. This is very critical. Disposium, terbium, and tullium. So, and this is very critical quantity wise. Annual production is very less, but still uh, the, a lot of China is dependent on Myanmar for a lot of, because, uh, because to process this material in, in Southern China, uh, this was a kind of, you know, uh, artisanal mining and semi-illegal processing. So China has cracked down or stopped this kind of production. So they depend on for other materials. And China is looking for resources and China will be a net resource importer to meet their demand. And, and, and 
and, and you think okay we can mine but china has also built strategically that you know you will think you can mine but you can mine when you can process but it you will not be able to compete with china in that value chain even if you have the resources uh, because china has strategically built uh, I, I will go through you know how china built that and or what is the chinese current policies next one please so four key themes that emerged in in la, in, in last years uh, chinese policy china rigorously uh, implement annual basis they very strategically look at this sector and improve their policies on on and and they knows where the material is going not only the countries they knows where the material each of these seven elements where which company is consuming what material so so you know the case of taiwan there was a discussion that you know when lockheed martin tried to uh, um, sell something to taiwan they were able to identify their supplies in were limited to china so you know they were warning to lockheed martin not to do that so chinese knows not only the countries where the material is going chinese also knows which companies are using that that the one chinese policies so anytime they have a export control law like any many other countries in the western world they have a number of restriction and 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 you know this is 100% even if not chinese uh, government own but it it is controlled then china also knows uh, very critical materials they have a national and and private led stockpiling policies that's really important and uh, and also countries like uh, us and japan also have and you know like we have in the oil reserves or, or oil stockpiling they also have critical material stockpiling policies and and for short term break you know what happened 2010 was actually an eye opener you know if something happens chinese suddenly so you don't need face a problem at least for one month or two months there's you you don't face such problems then china has been uh, increasing their quota allocation for processing uh, and, and 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 reducing the quota for for mining activities so because they get the material from and china makes that that <clears throat> the countries those who mine uh, you know it's you know the company for the companies mining companies it is profitable for them to send the material to china uh, instead of they making they processing themselves and selling the oxide or even making the you know even beyond the value chain you know for example if you tell about the magnets so so they may make sure that you know none of the companies from around the world are not able to compete with china they have a number of strategies and how that work i will go through next one please uh, so so the fact that we all aware of uh, that china dominates the first finished direct oxide output and uh, now about because now about 85 percent because now linus the australian company is, is making oxide in 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 malaysia and, and uh, in estonia there is one company european company a joint uh, a company you know multinational company headquartered in canada then of course in india you know one japanese companies uh, you know iriel provide the feedstock to the japanese company of toyota susho in vishak patanam and, and that's really exported to japan usually for the toyota and but also toyota's uh, tier 1 suppliers or other other customers and 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 out of this you know on the oxide level out of this total production china export about 30 percent is output as rare earth oxide this is largely the low level like you know low priced lanthanum and cerium which is critical for petroleum industry glass industry ceramics etc uh, and, and you don't have many, uh, except Japan, you don't have many magnet manufacturers. So th those who will use neodymium or pseudymium for magnets or dysprosium. So uh, then, so as a result, you know, climate change is the big issue coming in next decades. So climate change uh, regulation demand for sustainable energy and transport in, is strongly growing that we all know uh, which drives the demand for rare earth and rare earth magnets. This comes in increased rare earth material import demand in China. So as these, you know, China move their earth value chain, China will be a net importer of this material. Next one, please. So, so, so I said, you know, 71% of the global market is dominated by the NDFEB magnets uh, and China's market share is 90%. And 10% of that is uh, uh, probably 
close to 10% is probably the Japanese companies, three of them which make NDFAB magnets, but they don't have enough capacity. They have production plant in Japan and Vietnam, and, and maybe one two percent of uh, production by a European American shareholding company. And then China is the default destination for. So now you know you have here there are resources in Africa, there are materials for mining in Canada. There are a number of projects. There are material available in Australia. There are material available in India. Uh, but what what is the default? Like I said before, the default destination for this junior we call them. It's not big companies, small companies. Uh, junior RE miners output of rare earth materials and in so you have whatever you produce. If you want to make profit, you have to make you have to export that to China, to China if you want to make profit because you don't have big market for these countries and and ex China rare earth oxide production and NDFEB production face hidden challenges. If you start production, you know we it, you have to take it as a strategic uh, sector, uh, and there are hidden challenges. Next one, please. So a simple, uh, simple look at the uh, look at the Chinese uh, how Chinese play a game with the with the tariff and, and quotas. For example, for the uh, for the Chinese uh, companies, there is a thirteen percentage uh, watt on every rare earth metal for all individual rare earth metal and 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 for this level this is an intermediate product you know after oxide you make it as a metal and chinese companies don't get what refund upon export and then there is also a general tariff rate of 30 percent this is how they manipulate uh, 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 the global market uh, and also uh, there is an additional Tariff on U.S. import. If you are importing, no. So China knows U.S. can produce these materials internally, but if, if they want to import these things to China, the Chinese company starts to pay you know, additional import tariff. Uh, and 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 for the and if, if for interestingly for the if you look at the next one in the value chain for the permanent magnet industry, so there is also a 30 percent uh, 30 percent what? But interestingly. You get the Chinese companies get what refund 13 percent that re what you get back when you export this material to other countries. The Chinese companies get back these taxes. And additionally, uh, if any company buy any permanent magnet from 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 US especially, then you have an additional 20 percent extra tax. So uh, so this is and and and, and for other kind of rare earth like samarium cobalt, you have 25 percent additional tax. The next one. Yeah, and, and this is also, uh, you know, uh, on what? Uh, because on the concentrate level, you see, uh, and, and you don't have, uh, for, for uh, you have uh, the 13% and what? Uh, but for Chinese government don't provide uh, the, the what refund on, on this export. Okay, next one. Okay, so what, what, what does it mean for the global you know, market and, and the companies? All prices in China contain value add tax and, and what is not separately. So if you buy something from China, which is including the VAT price, uh, same for rare earth oxide metals magnets price, that inclusive 13% VAT. And what is a consumption tax, and which is actually uh, WTO complacent, so you no countries can question these Chinese policies in WTO. So that's the main thing. How they, you know, their quota policy. You know, it was there was a uh, case in the WTO when China, you know, have export quotas that was not, you know, uh, in align with WTO. So, but in, in this case, you cannot question this in the WTO. And upon export from China, uh, however, there is no what refund for rare earth, but there is a. Like I said before, there is a full 30% watt refund upon export of permanent magnet. So it's actually make Chinese permanent magnet industry very competitive. And, and you know, 20%, you know, if you compare with other, you know, if you talk about the companies outside China, they say the cost margin is 20%. So it's a huge impact on the global market. And, and especially on the, in the initial stage, this is 30% difference raw material cost can be the difference between profit and loss. 
next one please so so to to put it rather simple uh what what chinese government tells us the rest of the world rare earth raw materials wa we want from you to preserve our resource so it is duty free import no resource tax on imports yeah then finished rare earth products we will give you only if your cost will be higher than our own users cost so if if any company are using this you are buying oxide to make a permanent magnet uh, your magnet you are selling to the global market will be much much higher than the chinese are selling to the global market so this is so no refund on export then we will fill you up to your neck with magnets because it's cheap to produce you have the battery fund and and the, that is the highest in the intermediate level that is the highest added value product paid from until your last magnet maker is gone so that is full watt refund upon export then we will not provide you ec market access for your homemade rare earth that you have nowhere else to go with it so import import duty for rare earth oxide while raw material is duty free so so that that is you know how china is is is, is build up their global market strategy um i think this is the last one next one please yeah okay so so this is the last one and and if you have um, you know i i have concentrated a bit on the geo you know economic side of the how the global market is dominated by china and if you have any questions uh, or concerns please please email me or 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 ask questions thank you so much Thank you Mr Nabil Mancheri for that enlightening presentation you have brought our attention to the key issues and and set a clear tone for the presentations that will follow thank you